All right. Uh, hi, I'm Quan. Uh, I'm a developer from Mapbox, and today I'll be talking about traffic volume indexing on OSM. Uh, so here's an overview of what I'll be talking about. Uh, first, I'll kind of frame why we're talking about this, what the interest is, uh, and then there's a product called Mapbox Movement. I'll explain basically what that is and how it applies to OSM data and how we basically take that data and we can pair it with existing road segment information. I'll share an example use case, compare it to some existing ground truth data from Michigan DOT, and then I'll kind of do show how we can move beyond that and kind of show potential applications. Okay, so what problem am I solving, or what, why am I interested in this? Um, you can imagine if you're a tra transportation planner or somebody, you might be very interested in the number of vehicles moving down a road. This has implications from congestion to you know the turnover and the asphalt that you pave, how frequently you need to repave. If you are a transit routing agency or you know a transit agency, you might want to route your vehicles along lower free or lower congestion roads that are adjacent to higher congestion roads. Um, so the Applications are numerous, um, but uh, one of the things that we wanted to do internally as well is you can begin to QA your data. Like, the more you understand the traffic volume on that road, you can say, well, if I'm getting live data from that road, what, how representative is that live data in terms of speeds compared to what I see in terms of typical volume along that road? Um, so before we talk about that, I'm going to frame this product that I've been working on for the past uh, two years or so at Mapbox called Movement. Um, so for some context, uh, Mapbox actually has an SDK that's used in many applications and it generates uh, anonymized probe data at essentially sub five minute intervals. Um, so you basically get these snippets of activity along the road. The reason for that is that it highly anonymizes the data. Um, you basically can't understand the totality of a trip. but. Uh, what you can do is you can be, the, the impetus for this was it generates information that can be assigned to road segments and then you get speeds. And you can imagine that you're not particularly, uh, originally as this was designed, you're not particularly interested in knowing how many vehicles are on the road. You just need enough probes to get an idea for the traffic. This is how you know many providers that provide real-time speeds data uh, generate their speeds information. But what we realized with this data is that you also have volume anonymized at any different location in the world. So you can imagine if you were to break the world up into a raster, or in our case, quad keys, you can think of these, you know, say, 100 meter grids across the, the, the globe, and you can create an activity index. So you can say, well, this is how busy this area was today versus how busy it was in the past. This allows you to begin to pinpoint points of interest, analyze changes over time. Also is useful, as we saw with like the grab example, if you begin to look at the world as a raster, you can see these peaks, contiguous peaks, actually can identify new missing road segments. Um, now, Mapbox generates data from a huge number of providers. Uh, if you ever have read about people that generate this type of information, and then when DOTs try to use it, they realize there's a huge skew issue. And that skew issue is, let's say you're an app that is for bike enthusiasts. That's not representative of a typical cyclist in a city, so it's not going to actually tell you where you know a comfortable bike route is. It's just going to tell you where the most popular bike route is for the, for the type of user that uses that application. Uh, fortunately, since we have something like 45,000 applications, uh, we actually have a very large spread. But the problem with the spread is that at any moment an app can go viral and just start generating massive amounts of data, or an app can stop using Mapbox and generate no data. Um, so this is incredibly challenging because if you were to just show that, all you would show is a heat map of virality across the world. You wouldn't actually show real traffic or real activity. So the key aspect of this work is what we've done with movement is we've created something called owner mix calibrations. And owner mix calibrations enable us to create contiguous activity indexes across time and space. So no matter what happens, one application becomes popular, one application goes away, uh, that's all normalized. And then what you ultimately get, this is just, for example, an image of San Francisco. Uh, and the top left is some of our raw data coming in uh, from our variety of owners. We create real-time calibrations that calibrate that those total volumes up or down. And then ultimately, that creates a smoothed and contiguous activity index across you know, uh, regions, or in our case, you know, the entirety of the United States or a number of other countries. Um, so uh, that has nothing to do with road segments in a way, right? That's just activity on a grid. Um, so we're interested, you know, this is an open street map conference. Let's talk about some roads. Um, so when this data comes in, we also do one other thing. We drive classify these segments. So we actually run them through a modality classifier and we identify, you know, 
what type of modality they most likely are. For every drive classified route, as you can see, this is you know just a snap of Manhattan, uh, we'll begin to map match those roads, and those roads get map matched against our internal segment data. Uh, that segment data is then used in you know public facing project products. You can go and look at the Mapbox speeds project, right? That's a layer you can put into your map, and you'll get real time speeds data. That real time speeds data is also used for a routing engine, so you know you'll get routed around. Uh, you know, a slow block, for example, is, has been highlighted there. Um, but what we might also want to do is look at volumes, right? And volumes we don't necessarily publish in that, or we haven't published in that same way because they're actually quite different. Do you typically want to, do you want to look at the active volume on that road now, or do you want to actually understand that volume over time? The typical use case for volumes is to understand kind of the, the size and the use of that, of that segment over a period of time and compared to compared to that period of time, you know, in 2019, in 2020, and 2021, compared to today. So I'll go ahead and I'll just show a quick example that I'll try to explain that um, use case. And we can, you can show also an example use case and sort of the sensitivities that we can introduce with segment volumes. Um, so you'll see three images here. There was in a GIF earlier. Uh, we have spring 2020 uh, volumes, or we have spring 2020, uh, oh, those are out of order, anyway. <laughs> Uh, so the middle one should be looked at first, that's 2019, and then 2020, and then on the right is spring 2021. And what you should see basically is then 2019 in the Detroit area, you see a lot of congestion, right? This is a typical peak hour, uh, typical day in a spring of 2019, a uh, lot of traffic, heavy use of the highway system. Then if you go left inexplicably instead of to the right, and you look at 2021, you see very, you see free flow traffic in very low volumes. And the reason for that is, of course, you know, that's March 2020 when the pandemic hits. And then you can actually go to 2021 and you can see that traffic is beginning to pick up, but it's nowhere near the levels that it was in uh, 2019. So uh, we can actually analyze that area uh, temporally as well with the movement data. So we can actually begin to look at those map match segments and we begin to understand this is the activity index. So this is traffic volumes for a target roadway um, for the last uh, three years about. Um, and you can actually see that down to the day. You can also see the consistency uh, between days. You can see the noise volumes. The orange is total activity, and then the blue is drive activity. Uh, and then you can see the three target areas that we've looked at, and I didn't include 2022 because we're not done with the same you know, few-week period that we were looking at. Um, and so if you are you know, a traffic planner or somebody, you could easily begin to start to see the modality, the shift at a segment level. So this is evaluating all those segments as a histogram. You can actually see the leftward shift from 2019 to 2020, where most roads experience a reduction. And then you can see an increase from 2020 to 2021. But what's interesting is you don't have to just look at totals. Uh, thanks to OSM, uh, you can actually begin to use tag filtration. So you can actually look at the type of movement that's occurred. So each one of these charts is a year over year indexed to the prior year. So what you actually see is that between 2019 and 2020, you had significant reductions, especially in highways, but somewhat in residential. But then from 2020 to 2021, you actually see an increase in residential and only a small gain in highways. So looking at this sort of as a histogram distributed, you can actually see that there's a fairly normal distribution in terms of change in residential road traffic over this time period, whereas highways have actually had a significant reduction. Uh, we could all posit why that is. It's probably, you know, people not driving into like downtown areas, but people still uh, performing their typical residential, you know, daily uh, journeys. So, you know, why use Mapbox or, you know, what, what is so unique about the fact that we've generated this data? Don't DOTs generate this data? Uh, yes, they do, <laughs> but uh, they do in a different way. So MDOT is actually a, so one of the challenges is if you were, if I were to ask you to do that and you were to go out to your, to a, your DOT, be it a metro area or a state, it'd actually be quite hard to find really high resolution data down to every single road segment. Um, Michigan DOT actually has pretty good data for most major road segments. Uh, you can actually see they have a Esri map that you can actually begin to explore those road segments. Uh, one of the challenges though 
is that they only take traffic counts every few years. And although they update the map every year, uh, some traffic counts can be 10, 20 years old. Um, and then you don't really, you're not able to drill down to the segment. So if you actually really want to analyze a road segment, you might want to understand it from an intersection to an intersection, like a traditional segment of road, not whatever the DOT defines as a segment of road. For example, Woodward, a major street in Detroit, uh, the segment extends from one freeway to another and encapsulates the entirety of the Midtown area. So again, just to, just to contrast, what we've done is we've actually broken each segment down into every single node-to-node -node segment. So we'll take an OSM road segment and we'll actually break it down into each sub-segment and then ID those segments incrementally. Um, so the other, the other difference is, that, is coverage. So of course the DOT has to manually you know, count these road segments. So uh, their ability to, to achieve coverage is challenging. Um, so you can see on the left, this is the MDOT data set. And on the right, Mapbox, we actually allow for, uh, we, this, is, this is all of the road segments that passed our confidence threshold. And you can see that we actually get a large uh, chunk of the residential road segments as well. Um, comparing between these two is often challenging. And I, and I, I just would briefly touch on this. Uh, this is basically what I've done is I've looked at per, per meter uh, road volumes and I've looked at them at Mapbox data as well as compared it to MDOT data. Um, and what ultimately we saw is that uh, directionally they're comparable. If you looked at the top decile and the bottom decile, they actually are almost the exact same uh, segments of road. But uh, the mean deviation, the average deviation uh, for all the major roads was about 27%, and only about two thirds of our indices were within a quarter of the indices when I created comparable indices from the MDOT data. Um, I don't think this says that one data set is better than the other. This just highlights the challenge of what is a source of truth uh, when it comes to this sort of information. It's very challenging to actually achieve that. So, uh, especially when you're comparing a road segment that may have been counted once by MDOT, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so uh, it's just comparing. Yeah, so, so I think what, one of the advantages that can come from uh, bringing this data down to the segment level and then beginning to look at it temporally is just the amount of drill down that you can achieve that's beyond what perhaps like an MDOT would be able to enable. So at Mapbox, uh, we actually profile every road segment at five minute intervals, so, and then by day of week. So a total day of week is 2016 five minute buckets. And each one of those buckets has within itself a histogram of the typical distribution of volume. Um, but then you can begin to sum up the uh, five minute intervals and you can actually see the undulation of traffic uh, across an area by a given, for a given typical week. And that's what you see on the left here. Um, and then you can actually begin to segment that thanks to OSM based off of uh, the tagging type to basically see what the distribution, the sub distribution is between different types of uh, roadway classifications. Uh, so what this allows you to do is, you know, that Woodward, instead of just having one value, which the M, which MDOT produced, which is called AADT, their average annual daily traffic, so they had a single estimate of that, we can actually begin to index that and look at that in our buckets and see the trend line. Um, what we see here, uh, oh, it's better resolution up there, but um, you can actually see 2019 actually has full peaks. I think you can see, yeah, okay, you can't see it on my screen, but 2019 has very full AM and PM peaks. But if you look at 2020, there's no peaks in 2021. Those peaks are coming back. Um, and again, not only can you do that, but you could actually do that for every single road segment from every single intersection. And that's not something you could do with the MDOT data. Uh, so that gives you the advantage. This is every single road segment in that area around Woodward. And you can actually see the typical traffic distribution um, to the hour for the given week long period that we looked at um, in that area. Um, so uh, why do we deliver this data on OSM versus any other, you know, delivery mechanism, even, you know, as we're delivering this, these segment geometries? Um, for example, uh, we could use OpenLR, um, and we do actually use that internally, and one of the advantages of that is if an OSM ID were to change or churn, you'd be able to compare back and forth. Um, or we could just uh, polyline encode this data and send the polyline with the index to the, uh, you know, end consumer. Um, but ultimately, we've used OSM ID for a variety of reasons. First is just the tagging, the available tagging and the familiarity from the general population, the general consumer is very high. Um, and you know, there might, the stability for major road classes also tends to be quite high. So being able to deliver this data to individuals and for the road classes that they're most concerned about, uh, there's sufficient continuity and uh, consumers are often 
already using OSM internally, so uh, consuming so ingesting this data is uh, quick and easy. Um, oh, this is just a fun list of applications. So some of these are you know what people have talked to us about or are using uh, movement for. So EV charging sites is quite popular because everybody wants to know where the cars are. Um, but I think there are a bunch of interesting, you know, more uh, public-facing opportunities. For example, like traffic and regional planning. It always it always be interesting if you know you're a DOT and you're interested in exploring this data. Uh, what what potential applications you could use if you had higher quality, higher fidelity data available? Um, and you know, yeah. And I listed a I listed a bunch of tools. For example, our owner mix balancing step. Uh, and our M dot comparison. All of these are available. I think these slides are shared later, but I have links. There's blog posts associated with each one of those steps I covered. Um, but ultimately, if you're interested in this data, we publish all of our prior year's data for free. So you can get all of, uh, I believe, 2020 and 2021 movement data on our website um, for the entirety of the United States. And if you're interested in segment volume data and you're a public agency, you know, certainly reach out. We'd be interested in working on fun projects. Uh, I think that's it. Thanks. <laughs>